that I can not have anything hanging because they, the redos are going to be due uh, with these with these on the eight. Any questions about these? Okay. Um, because you have assignments out there and a test coming up, I will check email. If you have to get a hold of me personally, go to Amber. Okay. She can get a hold of Dr. Brayton or I. Um, but I may be slow in not looking at it all the time, but I will try to check one today and, and answer your, your questions or concerns. So that gives you ways to, to contact me if something you Okay. All right. So what did you learn about Hep C? Pardon? It can be chronic. It has an acute component like all of uh, hepatitis. And it has a chronic. What else did you learn? Mainly transmitted through blood. Say it again. Mainly transmitted through blood. So IV drug users tattoos. IV drug users tattoos. Okay. Perinatal? Transmission? Yes. Okay. What else? Now that Professor Rourke is back, you can impress her. What else? <laughs> They're telling me what they've learned about him. They don't have symptoms They won't? Yeah. They may not. So about two-thirds of people don't have symptoms in the acute phase. What else? Screen all baby boomers. Screen all what? Baby boomers. And blood I don't know what it costs to screen. So you, so often when we say screen everybody, uh, you have to take the expense in and what the yield is. So some baby boomers may have no risk. Medicare pays for it one time frame. But not all baby boomers are there yet. Are there yet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Has multiple genotypes or multiple genotypes? Has multiple genotypes. Okay. So what's the what's the ramp? Why well, know that? The genotype three has different. Does it increase fatty liver? So they may have different. Yes, some of them have a, more of an association with oh. uh, fatty liver. The That's drugs are two and three. The genotypes. Right? Mo yes, uh, some drugs now. The newer ones that have come out are pan genotypic, which means what? Oh. Hit all of them. Some of them are specific, like carbonates. What's the most common gene to talk in the United States? First one they named. One. One. 75% of that's one. It's important. It's important. Okay. Used to be, when it, 10 years ago, to, uh, 15 years ago, when I started seeing it in family medicine, I get them referred because people who have Hep C over the age of 40 have two times the risk of type 2 diabetes compared to those over 40 without hep C. So I started seeing a lot of them in clinic. And we didn't have effective drug. And the drugs we had, the side effects were so bad people couldn't tolerate them. So this is huge. The last few years with these drugs is huge because we can cure the disease. Okay, what else did you learn? Major organet effects is what? <coughs> Liver, okay. What does it do to the liver? Okay, what does damage mean? So yes, yes, damage is true. What does it do? What does it do to hepatocytes? It destroys them. So then what does the liver do as they're destroyed? Makes new liver cells and everything's okay, right? What does it do? Well, what's cirrhosis? Scarring and what? So fibrotic, so we replace it. So the body's going to replace it with fibrotic tissue, and eventually, if it goes long enough, they get cirrhosis. What other complications can they have from hep C? Compatomegaly. That must be early, because usually they get they get more cirrhotic looking. What else? Lots of liver functions, like issues with the urine. Okay, so loss of liver function. So cancer is common, uh, would be a com another common um, complication. Anything else? 
Say it again. Macrophage hyperplasia. What's that mean? Okay. Okay. What else? Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos. One we're going to do first because it has implications for um, for drug and why we use what we use. So what kinds of viruses are these? They're RNA viruses. So what we're going to do with our drugs is we're going to target structural proteins or non-structural proteins that interfere with its ability to replicate. You have seen this approach before. So usually what we try to do with viruses is, is several things. What if we can prevent them from entering cells? That would be great. Do we have any drugs that do that? Yeah. Not with this disease. Uh, we have drugs then that interfere with its ability to direct the cell to do what it's supposed to do. And then we have drugs that prevent leaving a cell. So those are our points, those are our three big points. If we can, don't get into the cell. If you get into the cell, we're going to mess up what you can do. And then if you can do everything you want, we're going to keep you from leaving. Okay. So watch this. Pay attention to the types of proteins that they say that the virus can produce. And then in a little bit I'll show you a, another video that looks at uh, targeting those, those proteins. There's 10 essential proteins that this virus produces that are, uh, are vital to its livelihood and we're going to use it with drugs. I first have to show you this. So I have a zoology degree, first degree was zoology. So out on our property, um, I've been interested in the monarchs uh, because um, 20 years ago, you could, in the, especially in the fall, when they were migrating back to Mexico, they would just, they would fill the air. You probably have never seen it, because I haven't seen it in the last 20 years. I remember going out to Hinton, there's a bunch of, of canyons out there. Have you ever been back there, Red Rock Canyon? You should go. If you're not from here, go out there. They're really neat. Well, there's a system of those canyons out there. And I remember one time walking down that canyon, and every time you walked, butterflies would just fly out of your feet. There were so many of them. So the, the monarch population has declined by 90%. So we're down to 10%. So they start in Mexico, and they come up every, they go down there in winter, and then they head back up to Canada every year. We are right over their flight path. It takes four generations of butterflies to get up and come back every year. So we are one of the spring breeding grounds of that. And there's been a big push to uh, preserve milkweeds, which is the only weed they use. But because people have developed land, they mow it, they consider it a weed, or they don't know what it is, uh, we've lost a lot of it. So there's been a big push to educate people. The Kerr Foundation does a lot um, of promotion. There are like 20 different varieties in, the, in Oklahoma. This is one of them. It's one of the earliest. We have a lot of these on our property. They're called the antelope green uh, horn um, milkweed. And if you, if, now that you've seen it, if you start looking, milkweed loves roadsides. I don't know why, but if you start looking, you will see them all over the place. Along I-35 and I-40, they are starting not to cut the median so that they can preserve this and other wildflowers. So that is a monarch um, caterpillar. They're very distinctive. Um, I went out over the weekend and I started looking for eggs because I saw monarchs on the property. And I found some really tiny ones, but I found some that are about this size too. Uh, and these are probably within a day or two of forming a chrysalis. It takes them about two weeks in, as a caterpillar to get to that point. So that's one kind. You can see them everywhere. Probably the more common one is this one, which is the butterfly milkweed or the orange milkweed. It's very common in Oklahoma, this part of the country. It's just now starting to bloom. And I found, I found about six on the orange ones that are getting ready to bloom. So anyway, now you know what they look like, and you can help promote them. Don't, don't, uh, they're, they're beautiful flowers, and they all look the same. If you look at this one versus that other one, they're all kind of like a five-star uh, petals. Um, 
and they um, they proliferate very well. They grow very well, well in this part of the state. So anyway, that's my public service. <laughs> so let's. Uh, So this one's going to talk about life cycle. I think the guy is French in this one. I can find a British one. <laughs> okay, so where's the sound? So maybe it is the computer itself. Okay, so where are sales on these? Yeah, the, right, there. right next to the time and day. You can click that little speaker. Yeah, you can push that. Whereas the nuclear council is located within the hydrophobic material of the nuclear and the pump. Oops. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, they've got a subtitle because he's got an accent. Mainly through blood and reaches the liver via the bloodstream. The virus circulates as a so-called lipoviral particle associated with components of low density and very low density lipoproteins. The viral envelope like the same proteins, proteins that are on our our lipids. Whereas the nucleotide is located within the hydrophobic interior of the lipoviral particle. The nuclear capsid is formed of core proteins interacting with the viral RNA gene. Once the viral particle reaches the hepatocyte surface, it interacts first with glycosaminoglycans and silicones followed by binding to more specific receptors, including the scavenger receptor B1 and the tetraspinin protein What did she use the scavenger receptor as well? The viral particle, complexed with these entry factors, reaches tight junctions mm -hmm. and engages in further interactions with cloud B1 and approval. The viral particle subsequently enters the cell by a receptor and clattering mediated. I've seen those clatters before. After its release into the cytosol, the clattering pocket vesicle interacts with the motor protein dynein. Star Wars, right? Dynein <laughs> transports the vesicle by helping the microtubules to reach the end of this particular area. Acidification of the endosome room induces conformation of changes of the viral envelope glycoproteins, which in turn interact with the endosomal membrane, leading to fusion of the viral and endosomal membranes. Membrane fusion is followed by uncoating of the nucleocapsid and the release of the viral RNA genome into the cytosol. Binding and assembly of ribosome subunits on the viral RNA is the starting point of HCV polyprotein translation. A signal sequence located in the beginning of the translated polyprotein allows the ribosome to be targeted to the translocal in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Translation can thereby proceed further, giving rise to a polyprotein which is cleaved by cellular signal peptidases 
and by the viral proteases into 10 mature proteins. These are important, it's where our drugs are going to work. Those the are the proteins which make up the viral particle comprise core and the envelope like proteins E1 and E2. P7 and NS2 support viral particle production while not being incorporated into the particle. The replicase components NS34A, NS4B, NS5A and NS5B are sufficient to support viral RNA replication. HCV replicase proteins, in concert with host factors, induce rearrangements of the ER membrane, including the formation of double membrane vesicles. These vesicles cluster to form the membranous web, which represents the site of HCV RNA replication. Viral RNA synthesis is catalyzed by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase activity of NS5B, which acts in concert with other viral non-structural proteins, as well as several host factors. After synthesis of a negative strand RNA intermediate, multiple positive strand progeny RNAs are generated from this template and either used for translation and replication or packaged into microcapsid particles. The latter process is thought to be initiated on the surface of liquid droplets that are targeted by the core protein. It is assumed that a network of NS5A delivers the viral RNA to core proteins for assembly into nucleocapsids. Nucleocapsids form at ER derived membranes where E1 and E2 accumulate in conjunction with P7, NS2, and host factors including apolipoprotein E. The viral envelope glycoproteins are acquired by bugging, a process which appears to be linked to the very low density lipoprotein machinery. Newly synthesized virus particles are thought to be transported to the cell surface in export vesicles via the cellular secretory pathway. Finally, they are released from the cell by exocytosis to reach the bloodstream. Pretty darn smart, aren't they? <laughs> And they have scum with our lipid transport system. They use the same receptors. They use the lipids to, to form. So you can see about 75% is genotype 1. Okay. And 2 and 3 are then about 25%. Those are the three I'm, I'm going to have you learn the treatment. 4, 5, and 6 are very rare, now, at least here. Now, they may not be for people coming from other parts of the world. Africa, you see those other genotypes much more commonly. Okay, so starting on page uh, one, we talked about um, what it is. So characteristics, so when I was in your spot as a student and as a resident, uh, we could uh, we diagnose people with hepatitis A or B, and if it wasn't A or B, then we called it non-A, non-B. So clever. <laughs> and eventually, in 89, they just, they, uh, typed it, uh, discovered its genome, and uh, that became hep C. So I understand there's now hep G. I don't know much about it. I'm sure that we'll, others will come along as we uh, get better at, at uh, deciphering them out. So transfusion or transmission, you told me about blood, uh, sharing needles, uh, 
uh, in drug injections, having sex with infected persons, those at most risk are uh, HIV, men who have sex with it, men. You'll see a designated MSM. Uh, they're high risk, very high co-infection. Uh, when you see hep C, you ought to look for other diseases, infectious diseases, HIV, hep B, and particular. Others can pass it uh, through childbirth. Okay, the genotypes, we talked about them. Um, I have seen some reports of a genotype 7 or 7 genotypes. I think what they're doing is they're counting one is now more subdivided into 1A and 1B. I think that's what they're calling. So the, the treatment is directed towards a genotype. Now there's all kinds of subdivisions and they are de designated with, with a lowercase letter. In your lifetime, I think we'll see more of those and we'll have, we'll understand who better uh, it, or which ones are notable and I think drug therapy will then be uh, targeted towards those. Uh, every year I do this lecture, it changes. So it's a rapidly changing uh, field or knowledge base. So this would be one if you are dealing with hep C is to keep up with. Uh, the, the societies put out uh, updates on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so if you're interested in this or you're going to come across it a lot, it's one to keep up with until it kind of stabilizes out. The big problem with viral infections, if with HIV, it's never ending. Because the viruses are so smart that they will continually uh, mutate. This one mutates, but we have figured out that where it mutates, we can direct a drug and the mutations are much less competent than the wild type. Uh, so it kind of does itself in. I think it's the MS5 protein that is, uh, doesn't mutate well. And when it does, it leaves it impaired uh, to begin with. So that's a problem with viral uh, diseases is that the, the, the enzymes or the, uh, the RNA and DNA viruses can change so quickly. So keeping up is, is a never ending battle. Um, so risk factors, um, let's see, I don't know that. some others that uh, you may not have talked about, incarcerated persons or people who work in prisons who get exposed to blood uh, would be at risk. Uh, people on hemodialysis, those before 1992, you probably talked about that, the blood supply, and those receiving blood products to treat clotting uh, problems like hemophiliacs uh, before 87. And then you all mentioned you got the boomers down. And in terms of clinical manifestations, you told me about two-thirds are uh, don't get sick. So that's a problem with this disease is that people don't get sick and it smolders along. Usually people get, get to contract these, don't always, at, a, at more younger ages. Um, if you look at this, you'll see that uh, the number of acute hepatitis, this is a crime, this is acute, has been rising since about 2009. Not sure why we had the lull there for a few years, uh, but it has been climbing. If you look at age distribution, again with acute, uh, if you look at the older population, the 50 and 60 year olds, those are the ones that have chronic. So they don't tend to develop acute uh, disease on top of that. So your 20 to 40 year olds are the ones that are most likely to have a, an acute. Uh, episode. Okay. So symptoms. Number one is going to be jaundice. What is jaundice? What is it? If I go out and talk to people on sidewalk, they can tell me that which are, that's yellow. But so what is it? So build up a billy ribbon. Okay, in the skin, so it turns, where are you going to most likely see it? Eyes. Eyes. Can be, it can be uh, enough that you can see the skin as well. Uh, nausea, uh, dark urine, white stool uh, could also be, goes back to belly uh, Right upper quadrant pain, uh, probably the least common of the, of the uh, symptoms. So symptoms usually develop 2 to 26 weeks after exposure and acute illness lasts about two weeks to three months. Did you all talk? How much did you go into uh, with the blood test? 
Mm -hmm. I did do, I briefly went over the blood test. <coughs> okay. We ran low, running short on time. Okay. So, in terms of blood tests, we're going to look at transaminases, but we're also going to look at the things that the body does when it's infected. We're going to look at antibody production, and then we can measure the virus. So, we can look at the amount of RNA uh, virus there is. Uh, let me see if this will help. So if you look at this, this isn't intended exactly for this, but it kind of shows you, it's kind of like with the, the cardiac enzymes, depending on where the person is in the infection is what will show up. So early on, usually the transaminases are going to rise before anything. So you can see those, that's the, the uh, blue line. Rises very quickly, can get 10 to 20 times normal. So what is a normal range of a transaminase? in general. Zero to 30. Pardon? Zero to 30. You are going to measure these in everybody. You ought to know them. Have an idea. Five to 40. That isn't exact, but it's very close. So when we say ULN, upper limit of normal, then what would that look like? If it's 10 to 20, what would that be? Upper limit of normal is 40, then 10 times that is 400 to 800. Anytime you see a transaminase that's 50 and above, it's abnormal. Now, most of the time in the 50s, we don't care so much. We'll recheck it because they will bump up and down. A lot of drugs, when you start a statin, they almost always have a transaminase rise. Uh, so we kind of watch it. We'll check it again in a few weeks and see if it continues or goes up. And, but most of the time, it goes back down. So people have bumps in their transaminases all the time depending on what kind of insult is, has, uh, the liver is dealing with. So transaminases go up early. Uh, the other is that the, the, we can measure the RNA viral content pretty early on, especially if they're in acute, uh, if they're having an a, acute attack that, that you can recognize and, and suspect a hepatitis. So those we can see for several months, and you'll see that's when they are most symptomatic. The red line is the anti-HCV. That's the antibodies. So antibodies last a long time because they tell you that they've been exposed, right? They'll tell you there's been an infection. So it's important where the person is and what you expect to see. So if they're acutely ill, transaminases will be high, you're very likely to see uh, are, uh, the RNA uh, assay come back positive, but you may not see antibodies. So those are the two things. Do they have antibodies? Do they have uh, RNA viral load? You can see by this that the viral load in this person is at present after about six months. Okay. So the body can, can clear these, the viral infection. So often, we don't treat the acute infection. So we're going to go through this again. So often we do not treat them acutely. There are some people we will, but the majority of people we are not going to treat them acutely. Because of this very thing, they can get over it. So why expose them to drugs if they can clear it? Now, they're going to maintain antibodies because they've been exposed and the immune system doesn't forget for a long time. So, we may wait six months and, and, and see if they still have a viral load. If they do, then we would treat them. Okay? So, that's what this next part is going to go through. <coughs> So you've got somebody who, well, maybe you just picked, you just uh, did their liver enzymes on a regular screen and lo and behold, they're high. And so maybe they have behaviors that you got up on the history that you're thinking hepatitis C or some other type of hepatitis. So we're going to do a panel. And so for hep C, we're going to look at HCV RNA and HCV antibodies. Antibodies test for exposure. The RNA will tell you if they truly have a... <clears throat> they truly have the, the virus. And then did y'all talk about liver biopsy? So I'm not going to talk about that, but you can also biopsy liver to determine 
Uh, if you look at the very last page, there is a scoring system called Metabeer, and it will tell you fibrosis grade and activity grade. So that may be done. I'm not going to ask you that, but I, I've got it throughout the, the handout. I refer to those somewhat. So there's lots of different ways to diagnose and figure out how much have they been affected. If they've had the, the disease for a long time, then their likelihood of having fibrotic activity or fibrosis is, is high. Okay, so results. Let's go down through the bottom. If they're RNA negative and they're antibody negative, they don't have any disease. Okay, makes sense? If they're RNA negative but they're HCV antibody positive, then you just you could be at a different point on that line. They've been exposed. If you check them three months later and the, and the RNA is still negative, then you can conclude they've been exposed but they do not have active disease. So who we're trying to figure out? Two things. Are you acutely ill with hep C or are you chronically ill with hep C? Acute, we're probably not going to treat you unless certain factors are present. If you are chronically infected, we are going to treat you because we can cure you and keep you from giving it to someone else and for having the complications. See the difference? That is an important distinction. Very important. That's why having to think through this tic-tac-toe of, of antibodies, positive or negative, is important. Um, if they're RNA positive and antibody negative, then they've got acute infection. So here you are. You're in this part right here. And the antibodies just have not risen to a, a point. You can see here, it takes almost three months before you get enough of an antibody titer that you can measure. So if they've got RNA that's high, then they're acutely infected. Okay. All right. Next page. So if they're RNA positive, HCV, um, and antibody positive, then that's where you're going to figure out. Is this acute, chronic? Okay. So what you're going to ask is, have they ever had a test before? In the last six months or sometime in the past, did someone also see this and check them? And that can help you in deciding if it's chronic. And if the answer is yes and it's chronic, then you're going to treat it. Or it may be an acute infection, depending on how high that, that RNA titer comes back. If the patient did, uh, did not have an RNA uh, or a, a, an antibody test that was positive or doesn't have in the last six months, then you're going, to live, you're going to look for the risk of a high exposure, high exposure risk. So what would that be? You've already told me some of them. You got stuck by somebody, you drew blood, and lo and behold, they have hep C. Okay? Or they, they're high risk. You got a tattoo that went bad. Something along that line. Or you've got RNA titers that are highly fluctuating. Did you talk about log? What does it mean if I say it's greater than one log on recheck? What's a log? There you go. So logs, logs represent a tenfold change. So they're a way to deal with big numbers. Okay. So if you had a uh, this means you've had a 90% change. What's a 2 log 10 change? 99%. Okay, so in real numbers, this would be if you went from 10,000 to 1,000, you've had a 1 log change. Or the opposite, you go from 1,000 to 10,000. It's a tenfold change. Okay. You're going to deal with viruses, you, logs will be part of your vocabulary. If it's a two log change and you started at 10,000, then you went to 1,000, then you went to 100. That's a two log change. Okay. 
So be conversant with that. It's pretty easy if you look at it just in base 10. But it's huge in terms of getting rid of viruses. Okay. So usually they're going to count how many viruses are in like a cubic millimeter. That's like a drop of blood. Our goal is that we get to zero. And we can't detect any viruses. And we can sustain that. That's a sustained biologic response. Okay. All right. So if the answer to one of these, going back to that next to last bullet, if the answer to one of the above is yes, they've got a high risk exposure, they've had a, a greater than one log increase in RNA, then it's probably positive for Hep C, and you would treat, you would consider an acute infection. If its answer is no to both, then they've got chronic. Okay, you'll just have to work back through those, thinking through it. And look at these pictures, I think will help you in terms of timeline. Here's another one. So here's an acute infection that progressed to chronic. So again, they had an acute insult somewhere, virus entered, the body starts to recognize it as not self, makes antibodies against it maintains those high one, high antibody titers over this one that goes out to four years. Acutely, they, have, they may or may not have had symptoms. Their transaminases went up, if you were uh, measuring, and their RNA load went up, and it stayed there. Okay? ALT is all over the place. just depends on how the liver is dealing with the infection. Okay? That is a chronic infection. So it's looking at the, only those two. So work that way back through it uh, and realize most of the time we don't treat acute, then we don't treat, but we do treat chronic. Okay. So who do we treat during an acute? Well, what's the likelihood that they'll clear or not clear? For the most part, we're going to defer treatment and we're going to wait and watch because if they can clear it, we don't have to treat them with drug. The body took care of it, so that's great. We like that. Some people may be very uncomfortable with that. Uh, so candidates for treatment during an acute infection. If they have a high risk for transmission, so they've got very high risk behaviors, they're likely not to come back for follow-up so that you could get them to come back in six months to recheck their antibody titers or their RNA titers, then that, those people you may elect to treat. Uh, if their risk of complications is very high, so their underlying liver disease or status is such that you're concerned that waiting that length of time will be very detrimental. Those that will have limited access to treatment, okay, these are very expensive. These regimens cost between fifty and hundred thousand dollars for eight to twelve weeks of treatment. Now, for the most part, insurance pays for those, but insurance sometimes won't pay until you've confirmed at six months that there's a chronic infection. So, insurance may not pay for acute care because they know that a significant number of them are going to clear. People who have contraindications to all the oral agents and were left with ribavirin and interferon, those people do better treated early than late. So those would be unusual. That'd be a small percentage of people that would have uh, contraindications to all of them. And then those who desire and can commit to early treatment and can pay for it or have a way to pay for it. Okay. All right. So when to start? If possible, wait 12 weeks. See if they'll clear. Uh, let's see. Somebody's already talked, talked about money, talked about that. Regimen of selection will depend on the genotype. It will also depend on have they ever been treated before? Did they fail a treatment before? Uh, and we'll get to those as we go down through. If you're going to treat uh, early than late, then we're going to use usually Harbone is the more common one for, for one and four. And the other ones will use a specific treatment based on genotype. Okay, questions about those?
Look on page four. So some counseling things. If, if you are going to wait, uh, then you need to counsel the patient. The patient's going to wait. So you want to avoid transmission. So it could be through don't share toothbrushes, dental, or shaving equipment. Cover wounds. Don't donate blood. Don't take, do, donate organ or tissues. Semen. Uh, in general, it, for people who are healthy who don't have HIV or Hep B, the transmission sexually is low. Those that have co-infected, then those we would recommend they use a barrier method if they're not using it. Um, if they use uh, illicit or recreational drugs, we want them to stop that. Uh, if they're not going to stop, then we don't want them to share needles. We want them to clean the spot that they inject. Uh, we want them to use a new syringe every time. We want them to dispose of it in such a way as that it doesn't infect someone else. Like the people who take care of your trash. You just throw it in the trash, they get stuck by a needle, they have no idea what was on the other end of it or what it was used for. Bleach is a very good disinfectant, so if you have people living in the house that get exposed to blood or blood's been spilled, then uh, bleach is a, a great disinfectant. Okay, questions about those. Okay. So we're going to talk about this very first section down in the yellow. I'm going to show you a video and then we'll take a break. So the antivirals for Hep C are, are primarily now referred to as direct acting antivirals, DAA. Ribavirin and the pegylated interferons are older products. Uh, they, had, they did not have uh, great coverage across all genotypes. They are very toxic, and we'll talk about those. Uh, one thing you always you need to know them because you need to ask, were you, if you failed, if you were treated in the past, were you treated with those drugs? Sometimes we have to go to those drugs because we can't use the orals. Approach to therapy, it's always combination. When we get to HIV, it's always combination. When you go after an RNA or a virus, you have to have multiple points of attack because they, they are, they're too widely. They, they've lived for millions of years. They will keep living for millions of years if we're around. So you have to get them like multiple places. Resistance is a problem. Some of our drugs are really good, and they're highly resistant to, uh, to changes by, the, uh, by the, the virus. Some of them are not, so we always use them in combination. Uh, duration uh, is dependent on whether you're treatment naive, you've never been treated before, your treatment, your, uh, your uh, treatment failure, previous treatment, or you have cirrhosis or fibrosis. So those are kind of your big decision points that you would want to determine. Okay, let's look at the video and then we'll take a break. So remember those structural proteins we talked about. A better understanding of the hepatitis C virus proteins, their structure and function in the viral replication cycle, has greatly improved our knowledge of identifying drug targets and led to the development of new direct active antivirals for HCV. HCV is an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus contained in an icosedric protein capsid. The outer envelope has a lipid structure anchoring two glycoproteins, E1 and E2. The linear RNA strand is composed of approximately 9,600 bases coding for a unique precursor polyprotein. Proteases coming from the virus, NS2 and NS3, and the cell itself cleave this polyprotein into two categories of viral proteins. Structural proteins, including the capsid C protein and the envelope glycoproteins E1 and E2, and non-structural proteins, NS. The non-structural proteins include protease NS2. Serine protease NS3, a cofactor for NS3 activity called NS4A, a regulator protein NS5A, and an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase NS5B. 
Chiral replication requires the formation of a replication complex composed of NS5B, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and other non-structural proteins, NS2, NS3, NS4A, and NS5A. Like most other RNA viruses, the HCV genome is highly variable. Seven genotypes with approximately 60 to 70% genomic homology are defined. These genotypes, numbered one to seven, have subtypes designated by lowercase letters, A through Z. Therapeutic agents with direct antiviral action have been recently developed and approved for certain genotypes. They target the different proteins required for viral replication, such as the serine protease NS3-4A, the multifunction protein NS5A, and the NS5B polymerase. HCV NS3-4A inhibitors, such as peritacovir, constitute the first of three therapeutic classes that will be discussed. NS3 is a viral protein with a helicase that becomes functional in the presence of its cofactor, NS4A. Functional NS3-4A is a serine protease that cleaves the other non-structural proteins, NS4B, NS5A, and NS5B. Like all protease inhibitors, NS3-4A inhibitors are highly specific and can be genotype dependent because of the variability in the NS3-4A protease amino acid sequence. Furthermore, the addition of ritonavir is necessary as a CYP3A inhibitor that increases the systemic exposure of peritacovir. Ritonavir is not active against HCV. Due to this variability, these new agents may be combined with other direct acting antivirals from other therapeutic classes. HCV NS5A inhibitors like Bombitasvir affect a second target, the multifunctional phosphoprotein NS5A. NS5A is implicated in the regulation of RNA replication and in the production of viral particles. It enables linkage with lipid droplets and its interactions with other viral proteins are essential for assembling viral particles. Agents that inhibit the NS5A protein are essential in disrupting HCV viral replication. The third class of therapeutic agents are HCV NS5B inhibitors, such as Dasabuvir. NS5B is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase within the replication complex. It is the key enzyme for HCV viral replication. Starting with the positive sense RNA, NS5B synthesizes a negative sense RNA, which in turn it uses as a matrix to synthesize a new strand of positive sense genomic RNA. There are two inhibitory mechanisms, nucleoside inhibition and non-nucleoside inhibition. Non-nucleoside inhibitors, such as Dasabuvir, are competitive inhibitors that bind to sites far from the site of action. This changes the conformation of the polymerase, causing it to lose its functional capacity. Three binding sites have been identified, corresponding to three types of non-nucleoside inhibitors. The development of inhibitors acting at different phases of the replication cycle has enabled the creation of therapeutic combinations. The Kirax with Xvera combines three direct acting antiviral agents with distinct mechanisms of action and non-overlapping resistance profiles to target HCV at multiple steps in the viral life cycle. Okay, let's take a break. We'll start back at five after. Yeah, but you go somewhere. Probably.